Good morning, and welcome to another week of the video worship service here on the Park Avenue channel. We are so glad you've joined us, and uh, just want to continue to encourage you to can stay positive. I think we look at the world that we're going, with the times that we're going through, and the present uh, path that we're on, and seems th seems as though things are getting better, and um, and we would like for that to continue, so that in hopes at some point in time, the offering of video worship service will be made available for only for those who happen to be uh, sick at the time or. For those who are completely shut in and an opportunity also as a uh, tool to reach others. Because we want to meet together, don't we? We want the fellowship and the, and the relationships that we long and at times desperately need. Today we will have some singing, a lesson, and continuation on the communion part. I hope, um, and we continue to hope, that in the days coming ahead, that we will come together again as a whole family and have that blessed reunion that we love to celebrate together with one another. Sit back, and we'll see you in a few. Thanks. church you know it's still difficult to speak to a camera <laughs> I won't lie to you because you figure you say good morning you're gonna get a response back and good morning and there's nobody here to do that for me but what a blessing it is to again to to come to you in this way uh, I thank God for the technology and the advancements that's made it possible for us to at least, it's not the same, but in the absence of being able to get together, this is our best path. You know, we've been studying uh, what are we missing, and today we're going to continue that, but in a whole different light, and it actually would be a kind of like a, uh, a, pa a discovery into some other issues. Last week in our Bible study that we have here at the building after worship here on Sunday mornings, we're studying the book of Acts. And in chapter 24, the, the class that Sean led, there was an interesting verse where Felix was uncomfortable. Verse 25 of Acts 24 states that Felix was alarmed, alarmed by what Paul was telling him and sent him away for a while. 
Have you ever been uncomfortable? Now, we know we have. In fact, I think today we live in a state of uncomfort. And that's where we're going to go for a while. What are we missing about this uncomfortable feelings that we're having? But the moments vary. You know that feeling when you're going into the doctor's office to get a shot? That uncomfortable feeling. Or for me, shots don't bother me. It's when they go to take blood out. I'm uncomfortable then. I'm uncomfortable in uh, certain circumstances. You get a, <laughs> a call from someone that uh, is irritating to you. There's uncomfortable there. There's times when you're having discussions of topics that make us uncomfortable. There are times where we're uncomfortable when someone's speaking to us about something. We are uncomfortable a lot. I'd like for you to, make, you know, in the coming days, pay attention to just how often you recognize you're uncomfortable. You know, Felix was uncomfortable in this moment because Paul was speaking to him about subjects that caused in him something to stir. Now, we all know as studying the Bible and the understanding that as we know the Word of God is sharp and it pierces the heart and soul of us. So we're kind of used to uncomfortable in that vein. But is there more to it than that? We don't like hearing or experiencing some aspects of our life. And that creates this uncomfortable moment. You know, John the Baptist was one of these men who stepped out in faith and, I mean, Think about, he stepped out proclaiming that Jesus was coming, the Messiah was coming, and did it all in opposition from many people, but people were listening. And he dealt with his moment of uncomfortable. We're going to get to that in a minute. You know, Chuck Colson, who was one of the men that got in trouble over the Watergate with uh, Rick, President Richard Nixon tells that there were many people that would come to the president's office and had made up their mind before they walked in the door that they were going to say to him what was dead on their mind and they were ready. They were fired up and they would do this all out in the outer room waiting for to visit with the president. And he said as soon as they would go in those elements of bravery and courage would diminish because there was something about that particular office and what it represented made them uncomfortable. They changed their minds. Well, John the Baptist experienced some of those same things himself. You remember the st where... John's in the dungeon and he sends his disciples to Jesus to clarify are you the man that we're I mean aren't you, are you the Messiah and if you are when are you going to get all these things taken care of John maybe not necessarily began to doubt in Jesus but he, I think he began to doubt the way and how Jesus was doing what he was doing. He was in prison, about to die, he knew. And he was like, Lord, where is the judgment? Where is the salvation for those that you have spoke about that's here? Why aren't we doing it? And Jesus sent word back to 
As Jesus is talking to the disciples, he's reminding them that God always keeps his promises, but maybe doesn't promise to meet your expectation. Let's read the verse. Luke 7, verses 22 through 24. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus is reiterating to the disciples and most specifically to John. There are times in your life that things are uncomfortable and it's not that I can't do about them, things about them, but because of the world that we live in, it will not fall into the way I'm going to do things. And I'm going to come back to this. But think of that statement of verse 23. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. You know, we must not let our act questions and doubts to trap us. You know, God is a, <clears throat> according to Philip Yancey, a self-revealer and a self-concealer at the same time. Think about that. He reveals to you what the life he wants you to pursue, but he conceals the path to get there. You and I have a propensity to want to decide those things. And I'll, pr and I'll give you what I feel is a good example. You ever gone on a long trip? There's always someone on there, if not one, but at least two or three, who know the best route or path to any certain destination. Now, today we've got GPS on our phones and tablets and cars and everything else, which gives us help. But I can remember the day when you got your road atlas out and somebody sat there and figured out what was the best way to get to certain certain place. And there would be discussions and potential arguments. Why? Everyone had an idea of the path that should be taken. And we still have those same attitudes when it comes to the life that we're living. When things aren't going the way we want them to, we become uncomfortable and begin to question God's motives. You know, Jesus admitted that he, he is the source of our questions and our doubts. There's a big difference between asking questions of God and questioning God. Remember Job. In all the things that he went through, he wasn't in the beginning questioning God. He said, I have questions for God. But there's a transition because of the frustration that Job was experiencing having the discussion with these friends because they were telling him, well, you've done something. And finally he says, well, if that, you know, uh, that's unjust and I'll talk to God about that. And then God shows up. It begins to give his explanation. It's not the one Job's in looking for, but it is an explanation. See, that statement, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. That is the most unique statement in the entire Bible. Because I thought our relationship with Jesus was not a stumbling block, but a Freedom made available to us. But according to Jesus' statement, there is the times in your life where He is not going to do what you want Him to do. And that's going to be a problem. And He said, Blessed is the one who doesn't stumble on account of me. What do you mean, Jesus? Lord, what He means, there are times that His way of doing things is not going to meet with you. But are you going to stay anyway? Are you going to stay faithful 
even in the idea that it's not going to happen your way. Sometimes the source of our greatest cut questions come when God chooses to show up in our lives, but then we observe He's showing up in the lives of others, and He's helping them, but not necessarily helping us. We must not expect God to meet our expectations. And what do you do when you have these questions and the doubts? First, we need to draw a distinction between the things God has promised us and the things we are trying to make Him promise us. There's a... In nature, bald eagles are accomplished nest builders. Their nests are usually about 50 to 120 feet all above the ground. And they ordinarily build them in tall trees, but sometimes they will use high cliffs. It takes a pair of eagles about two weeks to construct a nest. It will range from 6 to 10 feet across, and the center pocket where the eggs are laid is about 12 to 16 inches wide and 4 inches deep. And the base of the nest is made out of large sticks. Sometimes they even use thorns. On top of that base, they add softer material. Depending on what is available, they may use dead weeds, grass, or dry moss. On top of that, the eagles will line it with down their own soft underfeathers. Now, experts say when it's time for a young eaglet to begin flying, instead of dropping a fish into the net like they usually do, the parent bird will try to coax the young one out of the nest by putting the fish on a nearby branch. Now, if this method fails, the mother or father bird will begin removing the soft material lining in the nest. This is called stirring up the nest. Before long, the young birds discover that the nest is no longer the comfortable, safe place they've always known. It's no longer comfortable. Leaving the nest becomes a good option. The parents stir up the nest so the eaglets will leave the nest and learn to fly. The young birds don't seem to appreciate this process. But once they begin to soar, all that pain and all that inconvenience and uncomfortable things is no longer there. I'm sure they feel better about how their parents treated them at that moment, but during the moment, it wasn't good. Moses refers to this in his book, the, um, in his song, I'm sorry, the Song of Moses. And this is what he writes, The Lord found him, the Jewish nation, in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its youngs, he spreads his wings and caught them. He carried them off on his, on his pinions. This is from Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 10 through 11. See, God stirs up our lives also. From time to time, he takes the familiar nest and makes it uncomfortable from what it used to be comfortable. That's hard. That time of trial looks different and um, for everybody. For example, it could be when loved ones leave us or when jobs disappear or when the health fails and our bodies are in pain. We ask the question, why would God allow our lives to become so uncomfortable? The short answer is that God makes our lives uncomfortable because He wants us to experience something better. Now, I'm not going to attribute that God causes these things to happen, but He doesn't stop them either. And that's just as frustrating sometimes as anything else. Yet in Isaiah, speaking of eagles, what does Isaiah write? Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will not walk and not become weary. Our attempt sometimes to re-navigate our own plans takes us out of what 
the Lord was using to take us to a moment or a place that was uh, majestic. Can you imagine what eagles see when they fly above everything and the overwhelming accomplishment of look where you are. We can experience the same thing. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Do you think that transition from old to new just like that happens? No. As Paul writes, says also, I, I think it's in the same passages, same section, that he dies every day. You and I have to have our nest stirred. Otherwise, we will stay there and not move on to the next place that God wants us to have. You may need, you may, you need to be made new because your iniquities have a separ- that make a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you. That's from Isaiah fifty nine two. That separation may not seem like a big deal when things are going well in your life. When life falls apart, though, you begin to realize how vulnerable you are and that you need someone strong and loving to be with you and to take care of you. That discomfort makes you realize how much you need God. That is why Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. John 15 verse 4. You can't fly like an eagle without God. With God's strength, you can soar above your own circumstances instead of just hunkering down with your familiar comforts. You can find joy and peace in Christ. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6-7. See, we need to keep our eyes on the end result that God wants us to have. And all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Hebrews 12, 11. Give your life to Christ. And you will discover that when God stirs up the nest, <laughs> He's preparing you to experience a deeper and more meaningful relationship with God. God satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Psalm 103, verse 5. You and I are prepared for someplace better, and we're being prepared for someplace better. But it doesn't happen with a flip of a switch. Because we weren't made unrighteous at the flip of a switch. It happens over time. Habits always take time. Ask anyone who's made a change in their lives, whether it go from dieting, health-related exercises, quit smoking, quit drinking, whatever it may be, everyone knows there's an experience, there's a time where suffering is mandatory. But what's at the other end? Ask anyone who's gone to the other side, to to that place they're striving for, and ask any of them, was it worth it? And every one of them will say, oh yeah. Did I like it in the middle? No. But it was worth it. You and I, let's quit running from these uncomfortable feelings. And let God use them to move us to someplace better. We look forward to seeing you again next week. And if there's anything that we can do to assist you in any way, please do not hesitate to give us a call, text, 
email, whatever. We're here when you need us. God bless. See you next week. Jesus was betrayed he took a cup and he took the bread he broke the bread he poured the cup and then shared it and they had for as our understanding the first communion service as it relates to what the concept of Jesus is we just got through talking about suffering and uncomfortable it's uncomfortable to take a gift from someone I mean we've all experienced it when someone gives us something the first thing generally our reaction is here let me give you something in return for it we don't like receiving anything for free but as Jesus was explaining to Peter as he was washing his feet unless you let me do this you have no part of me unless you and I freely accept the gift and understand the importance of what Jesus did and not take any credit for what we're doing. We miss the connection of this communion. We desperately need, in our lives, we needed the grace of Jesus Christ. We needed the mercy that was afforded us on that cross and in that resurrection moment which demonstrates to us this other side of suffering, this new life that we want. As we partake of this bread and as we partake of this cup, let us be reminded every day of just how wonderful this 
moment is to have in our lives to know that the debt we owe has been paid and it was all because of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Father which art in heaven, we approach your throne of grace mindful of the fact, Father, that our even being here was afforded to us because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you so much for loving us enough to send him. And Lord Jesus, we can't say enough to thank you for the gift of your own obedience and submission that allows us to have relationship with you as a brother and as a Lord and King. Help us to understand. Bless this bread and bless this cup as we partake, Father, and remind ourselves of the love and devotion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through him that we pray. Amen. God bless. And we look forward to seeing you again next week on this particular service. Thanks. Have a great day.